see if I can make this work. Okay, can you see that? Yep. yep. Ideal movers and storage. Yes, we're proposing a uh, job site sign for that uh, project, which is a storage facility that's already been approved, but there's no signage there. So we wanted to get some signs out there, get the sign out there and, and you know, uh, represent some people as well. So there's also a drawing of the building that uh, is on the sign from the architect's rendering. So this yeah. is a temporary sign just during construction? Yes, for the duration of the construction. How long will that be? That's a good question. Um, I'm not really sure. I think that it, at least a year, but I'm not sure. That, that big mound of dirt is to settle the land. Is that correct? Yeah. Isn't that fascinating? It's got yeah, that, 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 that sign will be there well over a year, Joe. Because it takes about a year for this for the for the earth to settle. Is that a uh, is that a billboard? It's well, a it's a four they're by allowed, eight. The, I look at it as they're allowed one sign on the site for their business, and this is one sign for their business. Is it <clears> advertising? <throat> it's advertising ideal storage, and, I, and obviously those that are doing construction with them. I don't I, I, bank. I don't see that it's a problem myself. Good. I don't have a problem. I don't know what the rest of the board feels. Yeah, that seems um, fine. Yeah, it's essentially a four by eight. So it's uh, 32 square feet. I'd, I'd be uh, proposing uh, that for the planning commission. Um, excuse me for the uh, building inspector, and I'll put the uh, application in. Yeah, it's kind of a public service to cut down on the number of people asking Didi, "What's going up on South Maple?" Yeah, what is that monolithic structure going there? <laughs> <laughs> Base of a pyramid. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Can't remember. I thought it I looked high. It. I thought it looked high. I'm like, I don't remember the grades being that high. Now I understand that. That's that was what I, yeah, I agree with Mark. That's what I, when I saw them doing that, and I said, that's going to be to sell the soil. It I'm is. Sure. I was, at least I was hoping that's what it's for. That's good. Yeah, because yeah, I was like, that that I, confirmed. It's like, I don't think those drainage plans are what we saw. No. Where did you get the, where did you get the dirt? Yeah, good question. Well, well, there's going to be a lot of, there'll be a lot of dirt returned when it's all done. No, uh, I think I think they're actually know? borrowing it, <laughs> if that's possible. Um, it's, if you remember, Home Depot did the same thing to their site. Oh, really? Yep. I know he had to put in a tremendous amount of pilings, little pilings, like over six hundred pilings throughout the the uh, floor there. So that's what's going on there. There's a whole, you know intention to make sure that it's very secure so anyways any other comments on the sign if not motion to approve i'll make a motion to approve i'll second the motion a second any other discussion hearing none all in favor aye 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 any opposed motion passes unanimously very good thank you very much thank you all right thank you You'll send along something to the building inspector. Yes, office. Listen, I'll send out a uh, a waiver to the building inspector either tonight or tomorrow morning, so you can go and apply for the sign tomorrow. Great, thank you very much. Appreciate thank it. You. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. You take care. Uh, next up was just identified as iPhone. Oh, that's me, Jim from A Signs. Okay. Uh. I'm proposing some signage for AT&T at 355 Russell Street. Oh, over where the old eyeglass sh showcase? Um, no, they're going next to uh, 
is it sports clips and um, what's next to that? I've the got new no, that's on the WS side. Um, it the, should be uh, on the south side, right? Yes. Yeah, oh, 355 is on the south of Route 9. Is that uh, over, over by 110 Grill or something? Correct. Between 110 Grill and Sports Clips. Okay. Do we have a picture of what's being proposed? Uh, does... William have it or how do I do this? Well, let's see. You, you, did you send me something? I really don't remember. Yes, I think so. Okay. And what name, uh, what email account? Uh, J Carlin Jr. at acesignsinc.com. Okay. All right. Unfortunately, it came in sideways here. Let me see if I can. Uh... Manipulate this a bit. Okay. Back in there. And, and that was three fifty five, Russell. Yes. Yeah. And that's eighteen T. Yeah, it's a uh, 48.8 square feet. This is on uh, this is that uh, along that whole little mini mall that uh, were five guys in a rest are correct. Right. Correct. You're limited to 40 square feet. Oh, we are? Yes. Yeah, okay. if you're a standalone, if you're the only sign on a site, it's larger. But when you're a tenant... Yep. I mean, other, other, than, other than the 40 square feet, your sign looks fine. That's external illumination? Uh, internal. Not permitted. Isn't uh, sports clips internal? You can do the halo. You can do a backlit, but you can't do an internal illumination. Right. So it can't be backlit or in internally. Okay, so it can be halo lit. Right, right. Okay, let me, let me go back to Jones sign and... Uh, have them fix this. Okay. Uh, when's the next meeting? Two weeks from tonight. Two weeks from tonight? Uh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Uh, three. three. First Tuesday. Five, first Tuesday, Tuesday, Tuesday of February. November, uh, February 7th. Excuse me. Okay, so go down to 40 square and halo lit. Okay. <sighs> And if you just want to send those, um, send along the new uh, the new design, and we'll uh, I'll pass it around. And that will get be approved before the three weeks, or no, 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 oh, okay. no. But it can it can hurry us through in three weeks if we've already seen it. 
But just like the quiet gentleman, if you, if you have the everything meets, we'll, we'll give you an approval that night. You can go and apply for a permit the next day. Perfect. Appreciate your help, guys. Okay. Thanks. Good luck. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Roberts is next. Mr. You're, you're muted, Barry. Yes, there I'm going to allow Tom to speak uh, in behalf of uh, 303 Russell Street. Tom Reedy. Thanks, <clears> Barry. <throat> um, so two things. I'd sent an email on Friday relative to 303 Russell Street. Uh, the first was an A&R plan. So if you're familiar with this site, Barry had, uh, he built the Harbor Freight building, has a, a good lease with Harbor Freight, and then had built the rear building specifically for Jeff Waskevich and Rayos. And as you know, Rayos is not operating out of that space. Um, Barry's, as I put in the email, has been holding the bag for years and has struck a deal with uh, the adjacent Subaru dealership to carve off and then ultimately sell uh, that back piece to the Subaru dealership. And so there's, as is, is I see it, two steps. One of them is to actually go through the A&R process so that he can convey parcel B to 315 Russell Street, LLC. And then the second piece is uh, the special permit that was issued. So this is industrial zoning district and also aquifer protection zoning district. Uh, was specific to Harbor Freight, which isn't changing, and um, Rayo's copy. And so the the request is to endorse the the vote to endorse the ANR, and then to allow that modification of the special permit so that it can be used. Um, and I think what I put in the email was uh, service automobile vehicle service, motor vehicle service, and then parts and general storage in that, that back building. Uh, the building's staying the same. They might have to cut in a, a separate uh, garage door, a different garage door to get access from the 315 Russell Street site. But otherwise the parking, the, the paved area is staying the same and the building shape is staying the same. And Bill, I don't know if you've got the ANR. If not, I can show it on my screen and then the site plan, whatever. I do have it up, yeah. And I apologize. I didn't see this when it came in, so I didn't forward it around, but I can um, bring it up now. I think we got a copy of it, didn't we? Yeah, I, I got a copy. Yeah, I got a copy. I did. It went into the planning email, the, the your general planning yeah. email. Okay. I saw the site. I don't... I don't... Are there building elevations or anything? Or nothing's changing, Mark. So this yeah. this is something from. So uh, if there's a garage door going in, you would come back. Yeah, 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 yeah. So let's see. That's the driveway plan. Correct. Yeah. And you'll see that there's. Um, uh, lockable gates at the property line. So Barry had talked to the fire chief uh, and the fire chief wanted emergency access uh, around the whole site. So you'll see that at each of the drive aisle property lines, there are lockable gates and the, the fire department and police department will have keys. On the east side of the Harbor Freight, there is that much room today or is that changing the footprint? Tom. No, no footprint is changing. Everything that's out there. So the, the paved area that's out there is out there. The open space that is out there is out there. The building footprint that is out there is out there. So nothing is changing. Okay. I, I didn't realize there was that much room on the east side of Harbor Freight to the uh, abutter. Okay. Yes. Yeah, there is. Uh, yeah. Okay. I didn't realize they had parking on the, on the east side. Okay. <laughs> There's a lot I of guess parking. I've only parked on the west. Okay, I mean, let me bring up the uh, other the A and R. No, I guess that is. Not yeah, the that's ANR. that's the that's the A and R. What you had up was the A and R. Oh, okay. I, that looks like the same as the. Uh, hey, it's it's essentially the same. All that's different on the first plan you showed is. Um, 
we we grayed out the remaining, you know, the Harbor Freight building. And this one, as you'll see, doesn't have the access between because it's just lot line revisions. Right, right. Okay. Right. So that doesn't have the connector to the east and it doesn't have the fence or the gate. The okay. gates, correct. This is just for property lines. And this, then that site plan shows functionally really how it how it would work. So the only thing new is the three lines cutting through. Is the, there an the easement being through. granted through the uh, gate area or not? Pardon me? Is, is there an easement to be granted through the <coughs> gate here? In the in the deed from 303 to 315, I think what Barry will do is he'll grant emergency access. And it's only emergency access because okay. public won't have access that way. So that's why the <laughs> gates stay up. But emergency, yes, that'll be in the deed. Great. All right. Entertain a motion to approve the ANRs. I'll make so, that motion. Is this uh, this is an assignable ANR? Is it? Oh, that uh, is. We'll have to check with Randy. We'll... Okay. No, I, I. Okay, I see it now. Okay. Yeah, that is. So you need a motion to amend site plan approval. SPA and aquifer to uh, transfer use from Rouse to Steve Lewis Subaru. There's no, where the old building was, are they purchasing that too? They own it. That See where it says Frontage Inc.? Yep. They own it. They own That's, it. Yeah. It's a different entity, I think. Well, okay. it is a different entity, but they own it. He, where's the parking going to be for the cars? They were up close to the road, and that's kind of a new a new situation. So it's not grandfathered in like the old ones. Yeah. Joe, my understanding is that this that parcel, that frontage ink parcel, was purchased with some foresight given – the Route 9 work. And so because the work calls for a steep slope entering the site, they may need to rearrange their curb cut. So I think that's that may be what comes of it. Okay, we shall see. No, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so um, I guess the motion is to transfer use from Rouse to Steve Lewis Subaru and to approve the ANR plan. Oh, all in one motion? Yeah, sure. That's fine. No, 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 that's fine. Okay. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion, a second. Any other discussion? Hearing none, so, all in favor? Well, let me oh, just ask. Mark? This actually doesn't impact or it, or it actually decreases traffic to the site. Is that right? There should be no change in traffic. Yeah, be, because originally you expected a separate business back there. Correct. So you're actually decreasing. Okay. Yes. Yeah, okay. Okay. Although I, I do cool. think we probably, uh, since it is in the aquifer, we probably should have um, uh, Steve Lewis come in to um, ask for a uh, you know, waiver of site plan approval for use of that. Okay. So we're we're this is just a modification of the um, uh, three hundred three Russell Ray, Street. Barry Roberts. Site plan approval and aquifer protection district. This is not creating uh, permission for Steve Lewis to use it because we're going to want to know what he's going to be doing in there. It is in the aquifer. And so they're going to use it for uh, motor vehicle service and then parts and general storage. Yeah. More, more, if motor vehicle service includes oil change, we'll just have to make sure he's compliant with the aquifer i'd imagine it's exactly what's happening next door 
I think he's just moving some of those operations for a for a limited period of time, but moving some of those operations over to this building. Yeah. And, and and we're not questioning any of that time. We just want to yeah. have him come in so we can cover our bases and his so that we're both covered by right. just making sure we're all on the same page. Okay. Does the CONCOM have to approve that or that's already? No, the building's already built. Well, but I mean the change of use from coffee yeah. to motor oil. Uh, no, that's not CONCOM. Okay. Okay, we have a motion and a second for the wait for the site, site plan approval and for the ANR for the 303 Russell. Any other discussion? If not, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Okay. Perfect. Thanks a lot. You can turn to you see Bill, Joe, or myself to get the ANR signed. Okay. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. And next up we have Josh Klein. Good evening, uh, Josh Klein, Stonefield Engineering. I'm here representing um, Chase Bank on a potential application at the Hampshire Mall. Uh, we do have Lynn Gray and Bill Mahoney who are representatives of Hampshire Mall on as well. So we are, this was kind of, if you want to, I guess, Bill, if you could give me permission to share the screen, I can kind of introduce yeah, like the it. project. But as noted in some of the correspondence, you know, this project has been um, going on in the background for a long time. I think it's it's finally at a point that, you know, it is moving forward. You know, Chase Bank does a pretty extensive due diligence effort. Um, and we've been working very closely with Hampshire Mall, you know, over the last year to really get to this point, to introduce the application, you know, prior to kind of making a formal application. So I will share my screen. Um, so this was this is just the cover sheet of the site plans that were kind of electronically submitted and I'll, I'll zoom in. I think everyone here is familiar with Hampshire Mall. Um, so we have kind of the main mall building, we have Trader Joe's, we're obviously at the corner of, of South Maple Street and then- Chase, Russell Chase Street. Bank, Chase Bank no longer exists as its own entity. Is this just branding Chase Bank? So JP Morgan Chase um, and Chase Bank is still a, a retailer. Um, you know, I personally in the last year, I'm working on about 18 active Chase Bank projects in the Northeast. Um, they have branches, you know, all over the state as well as, as New uh, England. So this will be a, a retail. Um, will, it will, will it be a JP Morgan Chase branch or a Chase branch? It's, it's, you know, the, the name of the, I guess, the formal legal entity is J.P. Morgan Chase, but it is right. known as a Chase Bank. The signage right. will be Chase. Right. Um, you know, what they're, how retail has moved, there's obviously a big component that is, you know, driven on modern day baking. So there will be a drive up ATM facility associated with it. Uh, and there also is a financial planning component with the Chase Bank branch. And, and I might, you might add that, uh, John D. Rockefeller founded the Chase Bank. So John D. Rockefeller is finally coming to have them. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. There's a good, um, a great segue for me. So, you know, we have the, the Hampshire Mall property as a whole. We are, are really focused in this area that I'm highlighting on the screen, kind of at the intersection, um, kind of next to the Trader Joe's development. At one point in time, a portion of this property was parking. Um, and it is kind of a the kind of intersection closest um, to the road. Now this area, you know, is there's this ongoing mass DOT improvements, you know, which has kind of changed the property, um, you know, since the original approval and the subsequent, you know, amended approval. So what I'm kind of moving now is to an overall, you know, site plan exhibit that kind of shows <clears throat> the overall development. And then again, you can kind of see um, in that top left corner, the proposed um, Chase Bake branch. So the key here is that, you know, based on the original property line, the Chase Bank was set back 50 feet, but there was a eight, 18 foot mass DOT takening in order to add the additional lane in the roadway. So we will be seeking dimensional relief for the setback of the Chase Bank from the property line due to that takening that went on. So as I kind of work my way um, it's easier to see on this site plan sheet itself. Josh, not to take you off script, but that mm -hmm. has historically been a snow storage area. Uh, 
I don't know, maybe Lynn could speak to where, if that's going to impact their plans for snow storage. You're, you're correct, Mark. And also, too, I think there was a, uh, a leaching catch basin in that area. Yeah, so they, you know, there, there has been snow that's been stored there. Uh, the site does have additional, you know, open space. So kind of, you know, as previously approved back in 2004, uh, there was 26.1%, you know, open space. And that, that takes away the detention facilities, the wetlands, reserve parking, kind of all of those different things. And this application, you know, you're seeing, you know, because of the scale of this development, a 0.2% increase or sorry decrease in um in open space um or really a 0.1 percent decrease in open space so there's still plenty of available open space on site you know the hampshire mall will kind of have to work with you know its current tenants as well as chase bank for snow storage and it's definitely something on the um, final plans and working with the mall we can show areas that they will be stowing, stowing snow okay I always thought that that area, because it was depressed, was part of the uh, drainage system. I thought so too. Is yeah. That... So the no, it's a great it's a great question. So it's not a it was not part of the formal stormwater management facilities. So there are kind of three detention areas that were proposed as part of the project, and you can actually see them a little bit better in the aerial. Now there is some natural um drainage that happens in this area so i'll just zoom in on the area so there is a detention facility to the top right there's a detention facility on the right hand side i'm circling a detention facility in the bottom left now the area where the chase bank is going was not a formal you know detention facility now this this kind of open space um you know kind of the edge you know along this property here all of this area kind of drains and there's a pipe that collects it, but it's there's no detention that happens. Um, again, Trader Joe's facility is picked up and it enters into the on-site system. So we did prepare a full stormwater management plan as well as a stormwater management report showing that you know the new impervious area would be collected and it would be treated through above and below ground systems. And then it would connect into kind of the existing pipe where the water drains today. I mean, one of the big you know, kind of differences here is the DOT is adding a lane um, along this right-hand side. So the the plans as submitted, uh, you know, we we work closely with Mass DOT. We have their latest construction plans, and here's the kind of zoomed-in site plan. So you can see that kind of new lane on the left. It actually, as I zoom in, this gray line here is the is the curb that currently exists, and then this darker curb here that's going to be the new curb. So you can see the original, um, the original setback of the building from here to here. This was the original property line was 50 feet, but now due to the DOT, you know, requiring that 18 feet, we are going to be below the 50 feet. Now, one of the keys here is we are maintaining from the back of the sidewalk or the proposed property line to the back of our proposed curb, we're maintaining that 15 feet. So we want to kind of make sure that we have enough room to get landscaping and meet that landscape setback along the front and also be able to kind of collect and move, you know, any of that drainage that comes um, across this front area. Now you're, oh. you're going to need a variance for this. Right. Because and I, where is I, your I hardship? Because you're yeah, the, uh, the mall was compensated for the lack for the taking of the land. So what is the hardship that they're going to propose to reduce the front yard setback? Correct. So we will we will need a variance. We will be working closely kind of with our project team, um, as well as the mall in discussion with the hardship. Again, you know, the, the site as originally designed did meet the 50-foot setback. But, you know, in order for Mass DOT to add this additional lane, you know, Hampshire Mall, would, you know, there was about 18 feet of their property frontage that was taken. One of the other big in, improvements that is happening as part of these kind of overall mass DOT improvements and really kind of benefits the development um, as well is that the current driveway, which is shown here on the plans to get in and out of the mall is actually being moved down here. And this current is moving is being moved further away. So now this will actually be closed. So the driveway is is kind of much further away from the intersection and much further away from the Chase Bank. So there will be 
can a no, taking that probably by the, won't exist. Can a taking by the state state be considered a hardship? The, yeah, that's what I say. You 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 the, the the mall was designed one way. However, nothing was built at this corner. Right. The mall okay. was compensated for the lack of for the taking of the land. So from my opinion, I don't see that there's a hardship there because your frontage has not been reduced because nothing was ever built. Therefore, right. the new building should comply with zoning. Right. If, right. Wouldn't it be different if they had applied before the state's plan went into effect? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because, the, because nothing was applied for, I don't see there's any hardship. There's no reason why they can't comply with zoning. Just not at that location. Right. Correct. Yeah, again, so, you know, dimensional relief, you know, would be required as part of the application, and that would be approval from the zoning board. Is, is there a vacant bank across the street at the Mountain Farmers Mall, the People's Bank, or is that? Did that become... Um... The uh, chicken Popeyes. Did that get taken down for Popeyes or no? No, oh. Popeyes was Kentucky Fried. Oh right, right. I mean, I, I'm not trying to put you on a spot, Josh. I'm just mm -hmm. saying that that's a that is a comment, and from my point my point of view on the planning board, I don't see there's a hardship. Okay. No, and, I, I I totally understand. I I appreciate I appreciate your comment. So. Um, okay. I mean, uh, so are you, are, are you just, this is just information tonight, I'm assuming? Correct. We are submitting this kind of as, as information. Um, and I guess, I mean, also mm -hmm. kind of seeking clarification that we would need to, I guess, to receive approval from the zoning board prior to filing for site plan approval. I would, yes, I would think so for that. You, you could do them concurrently mm -hmm. if, if they also decided. But if you do it concurrently and a ZBA doesn't approve, then you got to change your plan. Understood. Perfect. So yes, this was a more of an informational se session. I mean, um, you know, we've been talking with town staff for a long time on the on the project, but we did want to get the board's feedback, um, you know, prior to making a formal application to both the zoning board as well as this board. When is the uh, driveway shift going south? Is that is that happening during the state project or? Correct. That is part of the state's improvement plan. Okay. So you're, you're going to keep the, the bank parking, parking area separate from Trader Joe's parking? Correct. And a lot of that comes down to lease obligations and things that are kind of out of the bank's control. Okay. So there will be that one little entrance into the main mall parking area. Correct. <clears throat> Correct. There'll be a kind of a single entrance into the, the bank portion of the site, and then the drive through would, would be able to loop around the site connected to the building and then exit out to the kind of the main drive. Okay. I mean, other than the other than the, the setback, I don't see that there might I don't see there's a big issue here. But I would concur at the setback is that that's a big problem because yeah. we don't want to get into the habit of changing the rules. No. It, it, under the, these the, circumstances. If the planning board is of that opinion, the planning board has appeared at ZBA hearings to, to voice their opinion on uh, the hardship issues or, you know, where is the hardship to enforce that? So not to say not to say that other folks haven't gone be out be, before ZBA without a hardship and been granted a variance. But it does seem like an uphill battle. <clears throat> yes, it happens, but <laughs> it happens. And that's okay. kind of a busy area, but okay. This was only informational.
Thank Mr. you, Jim. Quinlan has a question, Jim. Oh, yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah, just one thing you one thing I catch now is the fire chief would really want to know about the um access with the truck. Yeah. Um it looks like twelve feet or under on that west side. And he may have a big concern that he'd have to give a variance for that or approval for that. Got it. We will look to kind of work with the fire chief as well. <sighs> Would he have a turning radius around the north corner? Yeah, that seems like a tight curve, but uh, <laughs> there are programs that resolve that, and uh, he can give you the um, the spe specs for our biggest truck. That's great. Yeah, we we have auto turn. We have multiple programs, so we will be happy to to kind of run the run the truck around any other i mean snow storage i think was a great was a great comment um any other i guess you know i wonder if you could mirror the plan and put the drive through on the other side against um against uh trader joe's and so then your building would be further from the uh street property line I think, um, you know, I, there are many, many chase design team members that, that look at the sites, but, um, yeah, we definitely appreciate, appreciate all the feedback. I mean, I think, you know, I know, you know, both the bank and the mall are, you know, are excited to move the project forward, but we, you know, we do understand the, the concerns. I mean, uh, it, it definitely makes sense. Um, I think another question we had, I think probably Bill, for your end or for the board is regarding the aquifer protection zone. Um, if we're doing some final kind of calculations, now the underlying zoning is a 30% building coverage, but is this, would this site be kind of subject to a 20% coverage due to the aquifer protection zone? Well, is, is Chase going to own the site or they're going to, they're gonna, this is going to be part of the mall site, is it not? Correct. It'll be part of the mall site. So your 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 calculation will fit in as the overall mall site. <clears throat> so that you know you may not have twenty percent open space on the chase site, but because you're part of the mall, it's all one big mm -hmm. parcel. Yes, understood. Okay. Anything else? Anybody else have any comments, questions? Okay. Thank you, well, Josh. Perfect. Appreciate the time. Thank you. All right. Next we have, uh, let's see, who's staying and who's going. Okay. Um, sorry, it's just you're just showing as M, E-M. Yeah, I go by M. Can you okay. hear me? Yes. Um, so I'm seeking a special permit for a home business at 5 Lorana Lane. Um, I'm a pelvic floor therapist, and I'm looking to see about 20 to 25 patients a week. Um, there's, we just got a plot plan done by Randy Iser, and um, there's four spots in the driveway um, currently. What will be your home occupation? I'm a pelvic floor therapist. What is it again now? Pelvic floor therapy. Oh, oh okay. Yep. All right. Okay, yeah. Um, when you want to apply, we'll need the, uh, are you on sewer? I'm sorry? Are you, are you, are you, is your house on sewer? No, Correct. yes? Yeah. Okay. So we'll need a, we need the plot plan, what you want to do, a description. Um, it's all spilled. You just follow into the home occupation. Yeah. Uh, section Great. of the bylaw and yeah, Jim, uh, this did come in today, so I had not forwarded it yet, but I will just shoot it around now. So we do have the application, oh. and I, I think know. we got it, Bill. I don't know how it's being forwarded, but I, I received something, <laughs> right? Right, isn't it, uh, Emily and Ike? Correct, yeah. I think we approved a similar home occupation. Was it Farm Lane or Sunrise Lane by a couple of years ago? 
right? So this shouldn't be a problem. So, uh, so actually, you did send it to to planning, and you sent it to uh, Jim. So okay. you yeah. have it, Jim. Right. Yes. Okay, I see it now. Okay. So uh, we do we do you have the uh, two sets of mailing labels or addressed envelopes? Um, that was not something I saw. Can you? It's at the bottom of the application form. Yes, I see. Okay. Um, two sets of mailing labels, letters, seven sets of site plans. So uh, we need to send notice by statute to yeah. your abutters and abutters to your abutters within 300 feet of your property line. Okay. There is a tool at the assessor's website that will let you calculate that. Uh, but also the assessors for a price will uh, provide you with the, the appropriate labels. Got it. Um, and which is convenient because you'll be right in town hall and you can leave both sets. We need to send notice to the abutters of the hearing. And then we have to send notice to the abutters of the decision on the hearing. Great. So we need two sets. Um, if you pick them up from the assessor's office, you can just turn, literally walk out their door and the planning board, the town hall mill slots are right opposite the assessor's door. And you can put both sets in the uh, planning board um, slot. Great. I will do that. I will fill out the application with the fee and get it back to you. And just so you'll know, the fee is the price of the legal notice in the newspaper, mm -hmm. the price of two mailings, and 10% on top of that. And lately that, because the legal notice in the Gazette has gotten to be very simply rather expensive, mm -hmm. the application fees lately have been running about $550. Okay. And the legal notice is roughly $470 of that. Okay. So it's pretty, pretty depending on how many mailing labels you have, you know, that, that price will vary a little, little bit. Okay, great. Okay. All right, so I will do that. I will get that application to you probably within a couple of days. And I will, I would guess because, the, well, probably the, let's tentatively schedule the public hearing for 321. I mean, I'm sorry, 221. 21. Okay. Yeah, 221. And so is five coming off of uh off of uh South Maple Street or, or North Maple Street or off of Rocky Hill. Kind of connects through. It's about like halfway smack dab in the middle of the street. Oh okay. 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 Yeah, Loriana Lane goes right through from from uh, North Maple to Rocky Hill. Right. So my question was, is it closer to number five? Oh, it's closer. Okay. Them, right? hmm. Probably closer to the Rocky North Hill. Maple, but maybe okay. like, yeah, it's pretty much in the middle of the street. Yeah. Jim, uh, when did we ask planning uh, PVPC to come back? Was that going to be the 7th or the 21st? Uh, we have their blood scheduled for the 7th. Okay. okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I had put down... Um, a continuation of the discussion uh, regarding Colony Drive, uh, but um, the attorney had another commitment tonight. So um, I believe uh, Mr. Gelinas is here just to follow up, follow our conversation on the uh, payment in lieu 
the concept of payment in lieu, but um, you're not asking for any action tonight. Okay. All right. Do we want to bring up the discussion on the payment in lieu? And at least, I mean, get the discussion going, even if um, we want to wait for Mr. Gelinas' attorney to be part of it, or at least put his two cents in, but at least get the get the rest of the, get the planning board thinking about this because the way I've been looking at this payment in lieu, we kind of need to make, you know, we can discuss this. We need to make a decision. Do we want to encourage uh, payment in lieu and donations, if you would, into the inclusionary trust fund to build it up? Or do we want to make it more of a real life cost basis on what inclusionary zoning might cost us truly build something. In that case, it would greatly discourage any donations into the inclusionary zone, into the inclusionary fund. The reason I say that is with the price of building, um, we've got, you know, Ken has given us a few samples of other towns in the state that are donating into the inclusionary zone fund. And they're upwards of two hundred to three hundred thousand dollars per unit, spread over however many units might be divided against. Let's say it's six or seven units. If they're they're going to the for each inclusionary zone unit required, they're going to donate up to. I see a couple. Of, I mean, I don't want to start getting into a whole bunch of numbers here, but very pricey. A couple of other towns appear that want to encourage payments into their inclusionary fund, and their donations are in the order of a third of what some of the higher priced ones are. They're in the order of sixty to eighty thousand dollars. So, well, I, I think it may vary by which community you're in because just the price of land in Hadley to build a house is going to be significantly greater than some other podunk community, you know? Well, well, that, that, all I'm saying is that these, these places that have a very high payment form, payment uh, are in the Boston area. Their land prices is probably not much different than Hadley. Okay. Yeah. Um, and same thing with some of the lower price ones. They're, they're, we're, we're not comparing apples and oranges on land costs. Oh. We're probably close to comparing apples to apples. But the, the bottom line is, do we, want to, do we want to see the fund grow so that we can use that for, I mean, we're never going to actually build a house, but I think we could be using it to help encourage developers to put in inclusionary zoning as part of some of the developments. For example, yeah. you know, there's uh, the one in North Hadley. If they could, if they ever convert the uh, old uh, fire station complex into housing, maybe we could help them, incur help encourage some of that to be included as affordable by putting some money into that. Yeah, I we mean, could pay Pay for an elevator or pay or, to a big You'll give, give them a couple hundred thousand dollars and say, hey, we'll give you a couple hundred thousand dollars. You put a couple of portable units in there. Maybe it'll make the, 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 the entire complex uh, comply to the affordable. I, yeah. I'm, I'm just mentioning these kind of things to think about um, because to, okay, we got we got a quarter, three quarters of a million dollars in the fund right now or close to it. <clears throat> big deal. We could get one unit. On the other hand, we may be able to leverage that money into some of these others and get more, way more bang for the buck. You just use the word unit, Jim. I think we've got to decide what a unit means. <laughs> a um, unit is, the, this, Bill can kind of give us a quick view on that. Unit is not defined. So it's not defined by the state either. Right. So uh, for the purposes of the state affordable housing, any, any self-contained 
um, dwelling qualifies, whether it's a studio apartment or a five-bedroom house. But, but it, shouldn't it have to fall what the kind of the norms of the community are in that Hadley doesn't allow studio <laughs> apartments? So we couldn't we really say that's a unit in Hadley. Sure. <laughs> we, we, we allow accessory apartments and we don't, we don't regulate the interior layout of the accessory apartment. Um, if someone wanted to build a st accessory studio at 900 square feet, they could. Yeah. Um, I, I'm going to say I, I would encourage, I would want to encourage payments to the fund rather than try to harvest one affordable unit here or one affordable unit there. Uh, I've mentioned this before, but since we adopted the bylaw, this is the only subdivision that has been affected by it. And only to the extent of one unit. Now, uh, Barry Roberts got, uh, I think he was going to have to put in four units. Uh, but it was a different trigger at the time. There, there was an affordable component in senior housing. Um, right. how, much know, did, how much did Barry Roberts kick into the housing trust? The quarter of a million dollars? It was like 370, wasn't it? I think it's 370, but he's not, it's not all there yet. He, he's got he's, more to donate. Yeah. So, so think, Jim, you, you had said we had about three quarters of a million. I think it's closer to just shy of a half million. Well, yeah, got, okay. I was thinking of, of uh, when Barry gets to putting everything into it. That'll be a 370. And we also have 100,000 from the uh, CPA. So... That'll still just put us under half a million. Okay. Okay. But the, the issue with this development is that uh, Peter sold off the lots and somebody else built the houses. Is that correct? Was yeah, there a yeah. different builder for each of the lots? Yeah. That, that's that's yeah. perfectly okay. Yeah. Yeah. So We're, that's the more the standard than we see across sold the street. The, he sold the, the lot off, and I don't want to tell him how to run his business. And then somebody else came in and made the profit off of building the house. His economics get blown out of the water if we say that he's going to have to contribute as if he built six houses and have a, had a profit on six houses. Well, that that that's that was his decision. I mean, we did, yeah, yeah. You know, I'm, I'm not. Just, I'm not we, 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 the way Peter ran his business is the way he ran his business, and that's exactly yeah. whatever he decided to do. Yeah. And we're yeah. not designing these, this payment around yeah. what Mr. Gelinas did. Well, we're trying to design it around what's good for the town of Hadley. Well, the town of Hadley, the, the, the trust, the, the affordable housing trust can uh, accept real property. So as an alternative to come up with cash, he could always donate to the trust, the lot, and the trust could sell the lot off. I, um, I don't know if Hadley wants to get into the real estate business. Yeah, I, no, I don't think. Not Hadley, it's the trust that's getting into it. That's our. <laughs> that's still a that's still a ton of Hadley. That. I think we'd <laughs> sell pretty easily. And, and five planning board members could have a big say in that that sale. So I don't think I, I, I don't think that's what we want to be in. But that's my two cents. Well, why did we, if we don't want to be in it, why did we allow the trust to do it? You know, I so don't want it, to be in a real estate business. It's kind of counterintuitive to say that we, we would accept the donation of a lot at market value and then turn around and sell it without restriction from the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. Now, and granted... The cash it, would come into the trust fund. The whole, the whole it, point it would is, add it, more it would cash to... That. What's wrong with that? It's either that or Peter well, comes I, up with a bunch of I, cash. Well, I, guess, I guess that would be a possibility. Um, well, what do you think, Peter? Well, well it, let, let, on, on the flip side, let's say somebody donated a building lot to the Affordable Trust Fund. The, the building lot could be given to a developer for a dollar, sold to a developer for a dollar on the premise that affordable house be built on it. But then 
who's going to be responsible to maintain that affordable house as far as in the following up on all the paperwork to make sure yeah. it's, it's, it does with I'm, that. I'm not saying that an affordable house would be built on this lot. We well, would sell it the, sell, uh, is, this is, uh, uh, the trust would sell it at the market and get the cash into the trust fund. Okay, that's all I'm going to say on the subject. I think it's okay, you're idea. saying that, that could be spent elsewhere, right? Exactly. So it's, it's the downstream that concerns me as well, because just as we have not had a great reputation about maintaining our buildings over time, exactly. uh, you know, this is something, let's say hypothetically that uh, Mr. Gelinas does build an affordable house on his remaining lot. He sells it. He goes through the exercise of having a lottery and contracting with uh, Oh, uh, CDC, Community Development Corporation, or whatever, to uh, run the lottery. And um, he's done and on to, on to the next project. Uh, five, 10 years down the road, the lucky winner of the house now wants to sell and move on, is subject to an affordable uh, covenant. Exactly. They have to, in addition to hiring a realtor at uh, you know five or six percent commission, um, they will have to hire CDC to conduct a lottery, which will come out of you know what whatever um, whatever profit there is. Because remember, they have to sell it at an affordable price based on the calculations in effect ten years down the road, and. Um, we have no way of figuring out whether they're right. going to be able to clear enough to pay off their mortgage, which is probably like an 80% or 90% mortgage because they didn't assuming have a they could get a, Assuming they could get a mortgage. Uh, but let's, assume, let's assume they could get an 80%. Yeah, okay. they, had, they saved a 20% <laughs> right. down payment. They got an 80% mortgage. They have to pay a realtor's commission out of that. And they have to pay CDC out of that to run another lottery. And then... 10 years later, the cycle repeats. Um, yep. And I don't know who's going to be watching it. As we, I said, Rube, Rube Goldberg couldn't have come up with a better mechanism. Yeah. You know, the Hadley Housing Authority has told us that they, in very clearly, that they want absolutely nothing to do with uh, keeping track of any affordable units that they don't own. Um. And um, I don't know who's going to be monitoring this. Is it going to be uh, you know, the Affordable Housing Trust Fund? Is it going to be the planning board? Uh, is it going to be some as yet unfilled job slot at town hall uh, to monitor our one? Maybe we'll have two or three affordable units to monitor by then. Um, it just seems like we're going down a rabbit hole. Um, yeah, no kidding. And you're right. Rube, yeah, it's it's very convoluted, and it's uh, it, it's it's in the same family of when you start using the tax code to make policy decisions. Listen, exactly. Well, listen. Some of the best, smartest, progressive minds in Boston came up with this concept. So we've got to be something worthwhile about it. Maybe, um, maybe. Never mind. Uh, go ahead, Joe. Well, never mind in Boston. Four out of the five members, I think, are really pretty smart here. And we've come up with something like this that could have been better. So, uh, by the way, talking about the trust fund, Bill, I think we got to meet at least once a year, the trustees. Maybe we should put that on the agenda next time. We do, uh, but we are not ready to meet. Okay. The, um, we're required to have a member of the select board uh, um, and we uh, we currently have two ex-members of the select board who can qualify as community members but the select board has to appoint one of their own before and then they may even need to reappoint us before we can do anything oh, okay i'd like to make one quick editorial comment i think the town of Sunderland came up with a good plan. 
62 and older, and they have they want nothing to do with the management. They want nothing to do with compliance with uh, the uh, affordability, et cetera, et cetera. So they've washed their hands and they brought their number up. If there are any concerns in the town that we I hear, it's the older people have more difficulty sometimes than people outside the territory. So if you make it 62 and older, maybe you are uh, serving the population that is asking for it. So if we somehow could follow Sunderland's, I'm gonna to try to get a copy of it and bring it to our attention. I'm, that may have some holes in it too, but it seems to have worked out pretty well and probably take a, it's, it's not open yet, it's right in the center of town behind the Blue Heron, if anybody wants to look at it. Yeah, it's nice. I drove yeah. in there. Mm -hmm. So, I, was, it, uh, I mean, our, our, we were very noble in our effort, and, and it's not working comfortably. And we dropped from 13% uh, down to 12% or 11.9% of our affordable housing. Uh, that ha mostly have to do with Barry Roberts development. And we get in place of it, the money that doesn't even come close to replacing the percentage. So it, uh, I'll, I'll stop there. Well, I, I was just wondering if maybe PVPC could set up for one of our meetings that we could have a, we could invite representatives from other towns that have done this uh, repeatedly and successfully, and we could hear how they do it. Do they have a office of affordability that handles that? Do they farm it out to a CDC? Um, how do they do that? Because you know, the town well, outside I, does not Mark, want to. Mark, I think, I think we, we, have have the, we have the answer because Ken has not been able to come up with anything local. Yeah. He is bringing us models from uh, Worcester County and East, right. where they have been wrestling with this for longer. And I suppose we could try to find out how some of those do it. But um, um, and there's also coming down, there's, there's a been a continuing suggestion that uh, the excise tax, deeds excise tax should be raised. Um, and a portion of that, right now, a portion of that goes to fund CPA. The suggestion is that another portion of it could go towards affordable housing, even if it was only triggered by by mega sales um, that over over five hundred or over seven hundred fifty thousand. Uh, Boston is trying to get special legislation to do that just in Suffolk County. Um, but it also is discussed as a possibility elsewhere. And that kind of would be the solution to what Mike was concerned about, that it's, it's the, just the, the pricing that is the problem. And if that yeah. could, some of that could be redirected. Exactly. The pricing is, as you guys in the legal profession say, arbitrary and capricious. The, uh, some of the towns that have been a little bit successful, Mark, like Bill says, are in the eastern part of the state. There are yeah. also much larger communities that have full-time staff to address this issue. Right. Um, Ken has not been able to come up with any towns anywhere near our size or slightly larger that have been successful at these housing issues um, because nobody is really geared towards it. Remember... When we uh, developed the uh, affordable housing trust document, we borrowed from uh, Waitley's. I'm going to give give somebody over in Waitley a call just to see if anything's come into that trust yet. I'm just curious, and if 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 it has, how did they determine how much would come into the trust? Was that the one we actually ended up borrowing from? We looked at a number of them. Yeah, we we borrowed a lot from Waitley. It was Waitley's. Yeah. We, 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 the, there is a uh, general form that the state has put out, but Quaitly had modified it a lot as far as, because the, the general form allowed the housing trust fund to borrow almost at will and could like, it could put the town into some serious debt. 
It didn't have limits on the amounts. And Waitley had modified their, uh, for lack of a term, contract and had put a lot of limits in it. And we followed those with even some more limits that went a little bit further than them so that we put fairly tight controls on the housing trust fund uh, trustees so that they can't put the town in a, in a bad situ financial situation. Well, I, I agree with Bill that an excise tax on sales is the way to go. I'm just looking at Florida and see what goes on down there in case I ever decide to bail and move down there. But the, the fee comes on the sale. The seller pays into a fund down there, 0.7%, no matter what the size of the sale, residential now. So it's just a lot easier to a lot lot easier to deal with. Right. We don't have to deal with every developer coming in here because really by putting the onus on the developer, all we're doing is raising the cost of housing. A, a smart developer will build it into the cost that he's selling the property for. That's, I don't think anybody's going to disagree with that. That is a fact. Uh, However, so. um, you, know, yeah, I, well, yeah. <laughs> you know, as far as which way to go to encourage, you know, discourage or encourage in, the money into the fund, the reason I brought that up is because I'm kind of leaning towards, I think, we, I would, my opinion, I, I agree with Bill. I would like to see encouraging donations to the fund to build that up and not make it Make it high enough, but not unreasonable. That we want—we don't want any developer, you know, putting a hardship on them either. Now, what should the price be? Well, that—that that needs to be determined. Well, at the same time, we can't be responsible for the economics of a project that a developer comes in with. And if he mis—if a developer miscalculates, that's his problem. I agree. That's why, if we have a—if depending which way we go, it's either going to be a relatively high fee or yeah. a, a smaller fee, and it's going to be across the board basically the same. And this is what it's going to be donated. So if a developer, develop, developer comes in with this project, they'll know pretty much up front once we get that fee what they're going to have to pay. I would, be, I would even be uh, amenable to adapt adopt a uh, yeah amending the zone bylaw that if it's zero to five uh units they should donate something because we could see somebody coming in and just try to get under the limit because they don't want to pay any funds into it so if, it, if everybody paid a little bit right yeah you got these mcmansions go, going up in town and not a nickel's coming in yeah so um, when is, is uh, Mr. J um, the attorney going to be available, Bill? You said the next meeting of the. Uh, it could be either either of the next two meetings. Um, it's with, well, I think uh, the, the next meeting seems to be pretty busy. With well, Verizon maybe, and PVPC, yes. Maybe maybe the twenty first would be a good time, good one, because I don't think the. Uh, I mean, that's a home occupation. The public hearing that's not going to take a lot. So. Barry Roberts so far contributed five hundred thousand dollars to the fund. No, 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 no. It's, he's contributed some portion of three seventy, right? Yeah, the, his target's three seventy, and he has contributed um, uh, something over two hundred thousand. That's what um, that's what I collected from his attorney after we created the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. And the target is, I believe, 370. And, um, and we have 100,000 from the, um, uh, from CPA. And the capacity to ask for more from CPA, although that requires going to town meeting. But yeah, C CPA has a lot in their has, they have quite a bit in their available fund for affordable housing. But well, we haven't asked for any more because we don't have any use for it right now. So it looks like he's contributing here where I live, maybe 15000 a unit. 
and I, 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 I think there's 34 units going in there. Is that right? Yeah, it's a little more than that. Um, I forget exactly. Uh, well, I, I actually, I can find out exactly what. Yeah, but, but remember that that was three years ago, and prices have gone up. So the amount that has to go into the trust has to go up. Mm -hmm. So when I threw that 130,000 out a couple of weeks ago, back was I in Columbia when I did that? I don't remember anymore. That was not unreasonable. I don't think. Well, we can't negotiate without him here. Excuse me. Hang on just a second. Let me just get that number. Um, time, time to go out, Michael. Time to go out. The dog. Oh. <laughs> he's. I think he's out already. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you think? Of, you know, I was bored down there, so I started to think about how many uh, New York Stock Exchange listed companies do business in Hadley. Mm. Quite a few. I think it's upwards of 25, close to 25. And I think we could make the Ripley's Book of World Records. New York Stock Exchange companies doing business in a town per capita. Per capita. Mm -hmm. Ah, that's what I wanted. Sorry, just... Uh, let's see. Uh, is uh, 24,000 per unit. Okay. So then, but the minimum, is, the, the minimum Jolinas would have to contribute then would be 144,000. So I guess I wasn't too far off when the lawyer bar balked at that. Hmm. So that, yes, that that is a calculation. Uh, that's probably something that would uh, discourage any developer from. So uh, it gets back to Jim's question. Do we want to encourage or discourage? Hmm. Well, mm -hmm. yeah. In an ideal world, you'd you'd hit the scale right in the center and let them decide. But uh, yeah. we don't know and unless you, know, you have a, a scale per how many how many beds bed you know that may not even have bedrooms. Yeah. Well, and that's where you get back to what you were saying, Mike. About do we have a definition of a unit? We don't because it doesn't matter for state purposes. Right. But the cost of the, the cost of creating a studio apartment affordable unit and the cost of creating a three or four bedroom, two bath affordable uh, freestanding house are orders of magnitude apart. And that's why well, some- Yeah, exactly. But you know, if it's six times 24, 144,000, Good luck building a studio apartment for that if you got to go in and buy the land. Well, <clears throat> be aware of the fact that uh, that's why a lot in uh, Florence as well as Am in Amherst, they're doing this SRO, single room occupancy, which are uh, euphemism for a flop house. Uh, Not necessarily. I lived in an SRO in Houston once. <laughs> <laughs> So, you, but that you can is, that remark then. <laughs> but that uh, that qualifies each of those units. So um, yeah, it's, it's cheaper. Exactly right. That's where that's where they're doing it. They don't care about the community and what impact it would have on it. Uh, they just want the numbers. Well, as I said, I don't see how we can do a single room occupancy when, well, as as Bill said, we can do an accessory apartment. Yeah, I mean we. We're we're ninety percent of the way there already. Can you can you uh, build an accessory apartment for one hundred forty four thousand, including a land? Probably not. 
Well, ex assumedly you have the land. Yeah. Okay. Well, assuming, yeah, it, it's, uh, yeah, it's going to be one of those things that we're going to get, um, we are going to get unanticipated results if we push this, the, the farther we push this into uh, uncharted territory. But I could, I could see hypothetically my going to Dr. Zagrodnik and saying, uh, I, I, will give, I will give you, landowner, homeowner, I'll give you the money if you will let me convert your basement into an accessory apartment and put an affordability restriction on it. And I think I can probably convert the basement to an accessory apartment, satisfy the building inspector pretty economically, because I'm sure the house is in good condition overall. And the landowner gets a bonus and he doesn't have to live in the accessory apartment. He just has to live in the main house. Does, uh, does, he have, have it, does anyone have to live in the accessory apartment? Are you going to go be go be checking to see if somebody uh, signed the lease? I suppose once we create it, well, that's that's the thing with rental properties anyway. That uh, how do you? Um, it's a supply and demand. Okay, you have a unit, but <laughs> does anyone want to live in it? I don't know. Hmm. And besides, he bangs around upstairs a lot, so he, he, he'd probably drive away tenants pretty quickly. Actually, he would probably move downstairs and let's leave somebody in the main house. So that's where his man, man cave is down there. We're hypothetically <laughs> going into a rabbit hole here. Well, but I can, we got, I can we see got that. A, we, got a lot, we got a lot to think about, and the problem is we keep thinking about it. It doesn't be seem to, to be a resolution. Yeah, well, that's the thing. And I go back to the fact again that um, you know, this, this was, as, as Joe said, it was a noble effort, but uh, for all that we have gotten to the point of talking about one affordable unit in uh, how many, eight years, nine years? Yeah, you're right. Since it, we adopted it. I'm putting aside Barry Roberts and, and senior housing. There's, there's a different economy of scale there, I think. Yeah. But it is almost better to let a 40B come in and let them take care of it all. I like your idea of maybe one to five, you pay a flat fee per unit. And then when you get, when you trigger six, then we get into that other, you know, maybe a higher number. Well, well, I think we can talk about this you're right. Our next meeting as well, because Ken Comey will be here. Okay. Um, he was not able to be here tonight, and you were away last time, Mike. So uh, it's um, – I'll certainly have a spot on the agenda for it, uh, but we'll plan on talking with uh, uh, Mr. Gelinas and his lawyer on uh, uh, the 21st. Well, if we put the fee in on the sale in Hadley, you think we'd be sued immediately by the state to cease and desist? Yeah, we can't. We can't. Do, we can't do an excise. But if the state came up with one, um, the uh, the excise tax for a long time was two dollars and twenty eight cents per thousand. Uh, 0.0028, uh, 0.00228, and it doubled about 10 years ago. So it's now uh, $4.56 per thousand, 0.00456. Um, you, you look at what that is generating, that pays for the operation of the registries of deeds, and it also is generating a pretty significant chunk of money for the um, Community Preservation Act. 
And if it were tweaked a little more, um, you know, it's, it's something that when it's pointed out to you on your closing statement, I get complaints, but as a practical matter, a lot of sellers are so happy to be moving their product, finally found a buyer that they don't worry too much about the, uh, the state there with their hands out as you go by. With the pennies on the dollar, right? So. You're making Rube, Rube Goldberg turn, turn over in his grave. <laughs> Okay. So we're going to do our annual affordable housing trust meeting in Orlando or hey, we have money. We have money to pay for it. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think there's an like issue. Our, our expense fund is like $550 Mark. So if we can all go down here for that. <laughs> Excuse me. The trust is a separate entity. We can set up some expense money in there. Maybe, maybe go to Florida and look at how they do affordable housing down there. I mean, what the hell? So I will, uh, I will contact uh, the administrator uh, about uh, what we have to do to um, whether we have to be reappointed. Um, I don't remember if it was... Uh, it, it's in the document, whether it was a three-year appointment or a one-year appointment, but we definitely need to have a select board member on board per statute. So um, I would suspect that the best first time that they could possibly take that up would be um, uh, February 1st. And uh, whether they would want to just do a quick appointment like they did last time or whether they would like to put this out for expressions of interest from others. Um, you know, we we don't all have have to stay on the Affordable Housing Trust Fund um, board. Um, if anyone doesn't want to do it, there is no permanent obligation. It just made sense at the time that we probably have the most accumulated knowledge of affordable housing issues within the town. Yeah. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll discuss it with the, uh, the administrator and maybe uh, someone on the select board and see how they feel about how they'd like to proceed. And do the trustees of the fund, trust fund, elect the uh, chair because Christian Stanley is the current chair, correct? Yes, we yes. did. Okay. And as it's fine as he was a select board member, he was willing to stay in touch yeah. as a community member. Uh, th there's no reason he couldn't do it, but we absolutely need a select board member. Yeah. That's what we don't have. Like a boat without a motor. Okay. Hey, uh, Mark, how'd that Tesla run up there in north of, north of Montreal? No That's problem. Okay. I learned yeah. some. I learned some lessons. When it's too cold, it doesn't. Uh, the regenerative braking um, kind of works its way out so you it drives more like a regular car instead of a single pedal operation because normally my accelerator is also a decelerator and i have it set, set set up aggressively so that like i drove all the way to bradley without ever touching the brakes you know at stoplights at, at rotaries i could just ease off but once it's cold there's a little icon that comes up that warns you that you're not going to get much regenerative braking because the battery has to be a certain temperature to, to recharge it. So, yeah. So I learned that. I, I learned not to go through Montreal at rush hour, especially when you're looking to charge soon. That gets <laughs> little, you start biting your nails, like, you know, gonna go into a jam, go, go in with your battery charge. You know, I could have charged in Burlington. All right. Lesson learned. So I see that we do have uh, uh, that we have 
iPhone. And previously, iPhone was uh, the uh, sign guy, uh, Jim from Ace Signs. Um, I don't know if iPhone is him back or uh, I see we we lost Peter G. Yes. So um, if iPhone would like to say a few yourself. words, please jump in. Otherwise, uh, I have nothing else. What was the gentleman's What was the gentleman's name that was um, kind of just listening into our process? Uh, what was that young man's name? You remember? Gnotic. Gnotic. Jimmy Gnotic. Oh yeah. Um, oh, uh, what uh, under the heading of uh, uh, future town meeting topics. Um, the acceptance of, um, let's see, I did send around my email with uh, Steve Kinetsny yes. regarding Birch Meadow. Um, and- um, Is that on a future agenda? Hmm? That's well, no, like this is, we have an item on the agenda for uh, town meeting topics. Okay. Yeah, we've got so two of them. This is going to be on town meeting. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to update if you didn't have a chance to read my email uh, to and from Steve Knetsny. They. Yeah, he talked about a curb box that he said the town fixed. And he said that he he dug for two. Uh, what was the cable and he found that they were in conduit and that yep. was all he said so uh no particular right. issue now jim and joe and i specifically remember hearing a story about um the backhoe coming up with cables all over the place but maybe this is why we don't allow hearsay in court because we weren't there Right. And um, the people who were there or would have been there uh, don't seem to remember it. Um, I think I mentioned I also uh, talked with Dennis Pipchinski about it, who would have been involved if there was a water or sewer uh, work going on on behalf of the DPW. And he had no memory of right. anything bad happening along those lines. WWTS. What would Tommy say? So it was whatever whatever issue was occurred at, at Birch Meadow at that point in time with the backhoe was evidently relatively minor. Mm. And it got blown out of proportion. You're right. I think it was a TV cable. So anyways, um, Birch Meadow will be coming up onto the town meeting warrant to be accepted. They're going to, um, we they have determined that the individual homeowners own to the middle of the road. It is the road is not owned by the developer, by the way the deeds are written. So there will be a number of takings mentioned in the article from each of the homeowners for the road. Will the article um, have anything like, you know, are we required to vote so that we have a in support or not in support or no? The way the process works, the select board is supposed to refer the article to us for our input. We do not have to take a vote on it. If we say nothing, it will still go forward. If we say we don't like it, we get to raise that again at town meeting, but it does not stall the project. So the biggest, uh, the biggest person with an influence at town meeting is typically the DPW department. If the road's in good shape, usually it's a non-issue. If the road's in poor shape, that's a different story. Okay. Well, what's, the difference, we, what's the difference between this and Holly off of uh, anything? Not really. Conceptually, it's going to be the same type of taking. Yeah. Okay. In Hawley, the situation again, you know, the, the 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 developer had walked away long ago and had just never asked to have it taken. Uh -huh. um, 
in that case, because of the length of time, you know, I was able to stand up at town meeting and say Holly Road was approved by the planning board before any of the current members of the planning board were in office. Well, that's that was one of the reasons that prompted me to run. And they, the planning board actually did not approve that road. And it was overridden by someone from the state. So anyways. Yeah. So uh, Holly, it sounds better, Bill. Holly was just so lost in the, uh, the mists of time that, uh, and it also was the uh, primary access to our uh, uh, wellhead that um, the town just bit the bullet and uh, took it and fixed the road. Right. And when did we start uh, holding a parcel you know, on the... Well, we've always been holding them, but uh, it... it you get into this little gray area at some point, once the road is completed, um, we could we hold the funds for completion of the road to town specifications, but we do not hold the money Until for acceptance. acceptance of the road. So once it has been completed and gone through a year of, um, you know, a f full seasons as a completed road, the developer is entitled to ask for their money back. And they would prove that they built it to town standards. Yes. But once they do that, that is their obligation. Okay. Um, now you get a developer like Ron Burkume, who is doing, con was doing continuing work in town. So once one road was done, he, wanted to move on to the next road he wanted to get rid of the burden of maintaining the prior road so he would bring it to town meeting and say please accept it and if it was in good condition or he sometimes agreed to make a few updates but uh we just <clears throat> had this pattern going on where it was excuse me it was in the developer's enlightened self-interest to ask to have the road accepted. Yeah. And then we just had a couple of situations where you had someone who just disappeared. In the case of uh, Birch Meadow, it was sort of somewhat involuntary. There was a bankruptcy involved and ownership of the development changed hands. Um, uh, but you know, that's that's the thing that when you have a one shot developer who has basically doesn't want to spend the extra to get the road, get the paperwork done. Um, so, uh, yeah, bit of a bit of a snag, but uh, we're working through this one. Well, that street behind your house, Jim, looks like it's held up over the years. Um, well, no. Oh, no? No, it's, it, it's got a lot of repairs on it. And if they're, they've, been, they've been crack sealing it the last couple of years. And you drive down that road, you'll see all the crack seals. So before it could be accepted as, town, as a town road, I would expect the DPW would rather would want to see a top call put on it. Right, right. Uh, I mean, it, it is almost... 11 to 12 years old. Yeah. Granted, it hasn't seen a lot of traffic except for all the farm tractors that run up and down. Yeah. But there's some there's some pretty big rigs that run up and down that road for farm tractors. Yeah, I think it was paved when I lived over there. Yeah. yeah. So it's it's been, you know, and it, it, it it's it's showing a little bit of age, you know. But hmm. well, when it was put in, did the developer had to have to adhere to any specifications or did it they just go in and do it oh no no it was it was built to town specs okay oh yeah it was built to town spec but the problem is any road after that number of years is going to show yeah. some wear and tear okay you know i mean you got utilities that run back and forth under the road and everything else and no matter how good you put the bait everything in 
you're going to see some cracks in the road. And when you wheel start running, town would do scheduled you know, maintenance. Yeah. You, know, you, you start running the tin wheelers that they run up and down the road with the farm equipment. There, like I said, there's some there's some good size equipment that runs on that road. Not a lot, but there's some good there's there's, there's some big stuff. <clears throat> so um, for the town meeting, I Ken gave us some stuff for uh, basically for special event venues. I'm going to put them in the form of warrant articles and circulate them, make a few editorial changes that I think need to be done. And we need to discuss those. I like to get, get the, I would like to get them on a town meeting warrant for the annual and the police and fire department and town administrator um, would also like to see those on the warrant articles before the next uh, summer season comes up along because it's, they're, they're trying to head off issues that are occurring at various places in town. This, is, this may be a little tricky. Uh, maybe Bill Dwyer wants to comment about the Asparagus Festival on the town common. How do we handle that within the uh, our potential bylaw? You were discussing that today, Bill, right? Yeah. Um, so that's sort of a mega event, but only once a year. Uh, I think what the drafts we've looked at are more for uh, recurring yes. events. Um, it's certainly something we can look at. I don't know, uh, since it, it's town property and it's with the approval of the uh, select board um, and oversight from health, police, fire. Uh, and that's you know, not, they're not even town townspeople that run that, right? That's correct. And we have to spend all that money with police, fire, and protection? We don't have to. The select board chooses to. Okay. That's are there are there permits every year for the flea market down uh, across from Norwalk? That has but, not occurred for the last three years. And they have a ZBA uh, special permit or variance to overrule zoning. Oh, they, they have a variance to go back beyond the 300 feet. However, the police um, detail that is over there was paid for by the owner of the property every Sunday. Anything from the building department this week? Uh, no, I was just going to, the asparagus fest, that's, that's the feedback I've been getting is that, um, you know, I don't think any of the asparagus, you know, in the town of Hadley and, and um, a lot of complaints we had were the, they couldn't even get through to get to their land to farm because of the event. So it really is, seems to hurt the town, cost us money then, even though they are paying for the, you know, police and fire, still, we had a half hour in the meeting today that we discussed it, you know, all the town people and uh, town employees, and it gets us nowhere. Um, and the other thing I just wanted to mention is that select board did already receive for a entertainment license. They've already received it yesterday, I believe, or today, I should say, for one of the venues. So um, want to just talk to, we did discuss that, I guess, sometime. They're going to want some feedback as to how they should go about you know, issuing that in that location. Okay. Well, that's on the common. No, it's a different location that zoning wise, um, you know, everybody would want to have a entertainment license if that's the case. That's the only, mm -hmm. the only bad thing with that issue. <clears throat> exactly. Yeah. Well, so who's, everybody who's wants to see the business do well, but it's, <laughs> Who sponsors the Asparagus Festival? WGBH. It's a fundraiser for, or, or is it, what, what are they now? New England Public Media? Yeah. Used to be FCR. Well, they, I guess the federal government doesn't give them enough then, huh? So. No, do and so the theme, the theme is we we are we support your 
if you want to put up a little cart in your front yard and sell your asparagus there, no one is concerned about that. Um, it's if, if you want to do your own weekly asparagus festival in season, um, and you have 50 cars coming each week, we want to know that you have a spot to park them. Well, you know, the whole notion of a town common means that it was for townspeople, period. That was to keep the cows there, Mike. <laughs> you well, didn't want that, you know, that was a fort that was built around well, you, here to keep somebody from Northampton wasn't here. great. My point is, somebody, but well, you get my drift. Well, yes. how many of the Northampton was, were, wasn't bringing their cow over to graves, were they? Well, that, we, we digress. I move, we adjourn. <laughs> anybody have any, well, before that, anybody have anything else? Hearing none, we have a motion to adjourn. Second. Have a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Meet in meeting is history. Thank you. And thank you, Alex. And thank you, Tom. <laughs>